Thanks, Josh. I hope you'll uh, have your Bibles open or can get there quickly with the um, the passage we're going to focus on today is, as we've mentioned, a very familiar passage, but I think it has uh, very relevant um, application to our hearts and minds today, even uh, more than just simply uh, remembering an old story. That these things have been given for our example, as, as Paul says. Before we dive in, imagine, is anyone here, maybe you could raise your hand, I, I would love a little test case in, in this congregation, has anyone heard of the term an ethnography? If you have, raise your hand. Okay, ethnography, I've got a handful of people. Uh, an ethnography is a term for the study of, ethno is people, right? You ever heard of uh, ethno is the, the idea that it's people and graphy, that word means the study of, the study of people, the study of a foreign people is really what the word ethnography means. And in the process of ethnography, what happens is people, they will go and they will um, observe and, and take notes and, and write and say, they'll follow people around and watch what kind of clothes they wear, watch what kind of habits they partake in, the way they speak. And really, you could engage in the process of this even within your own culture, but generally it's a foreign culture. So imagine for a second that someone came to your home and they, uh, they asked, can I live with you for a year? Now, after you said no, for some reason they're forcing, you have to say yes, okay? Because <laughs> most of us would say, no, we'd rather not you live with us for a year. But now there's this person living with you for a year, and they have a little book, and they begin to take notes, and they begin to journal and observe and, and watch you. They notice that every morning you do seven similar things. And they happen to be a person from another place who doesn't understand. And so they begin to ask questions about why you do what you do. And why do you do this often? And, and perhaps at the end of the year, they, they take this sample and they, they've categorized these things. And they come to ask you, uh, or they come to say, you know, thank you for how you've hosted them and shared meals with them and these things. And, and you just can't help yourself. You're curious, you know, what, what were their results? What, what did they find? And, and as you ask them what they've learned, they begin to describe to you a person that sounds very foreign to you because you've become so accustomed to your morning rituals that you never noticed that you always begin by checking Facebook on your phone. And you always begin by looking up the scores from the games of the night before. And you always take a moment to read this blog post or find out about whatever celebrity. And you rarely turn and open God's word in comparison. You, you, you check Twitter and Facebook and send messages with your friends up until late hours of the night. But Almost never did your guest observe you spending time in prayer at those same hours late at night. And, and the description this, this person gives, it describes actions that don't bother you so much as that over the course of the year you begin to realize that those actions betray a value set, a system of seeing the world a, an order of priorities. For instance, they say this person spends almost every evening learning from this glowing box, devoting their calendar to make sure that they are in front of the glowing box at certain times of the week. And whenever they don't have something on their calendar, they make sure that they fill that time by sitting in front of the glowing box. The TV, right? And you hear this description and you realize that if someone came that wasn't used to your cadence of life, what they would see, about, how they would answer this question, what matters most, may be drastically different than what we say 
You see, our actions, they tell us what we truly value. Our habits tell us what we truly believe. We say we believe prayer is powerful, and I'll testify we, I'm saying we, but then do we pray? We say the word of God is the source of life. It is the most important thing, but does the glowing box get 10 times the amount of attention if we just looked at our calendar? 100 times the amount of attention? Infinitely more if we're not opening God's word? This question of what matters most is actually raised in the, this story that we're very familiar with. And I think the structure of the book of Exodus, it's important for us to see what matters most by looking at the golden calf story, not just by the time this, this calf comes out of the fire, but in its whole, because Israel is going to be presented, confronted with what matters most. We mentioned some of this in the tabernacle last week. What matters most? And I think that at times we can mistake what Israel's done for this wholesale rejection of God and throwing off of who God is in the middle of a story full of God's actions. But the truth is that this is probably a lot more explainable and understandable the way that our lives, described in our view, not the ethnographer's view, are a lot more explainable and understandable. Well, you don't understand. We watch shows together because it's something where my wife and I can sit down and end our day together. No, we don't really ever read God's Word together, but you just don't understand. It's harder to read the Bible together or pray together than it is to sit and watch a sitcom. And, 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 we, and we begin to, you, you don't understand. And this is, the where we, this is where we come in Exodus chapter 32. Really, um, a, an intense theological point is being made by dropping this story in the midst of the giving of the law and the describing of the tabernacle. Last week we saw that God's presence is the most important thing about Israel. And now, at the beginning of chapter 32, what happens? When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. Now tell me this. Are those words accidental? No. I'm telling you, no. Because who has gone before them? In the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud? Who has been with them? God. Himself, who has been in view in the description of the tabernacle and the worship system, God in the very presence of Israel, right? Who has been the mediator of that presence? Moses. Remember, Moses, as we've seen, going down the mountain to talk to the people and going back up the mountain to talk to God, giving them the words of God. And you, I think that often we regard this moment as these people just having almost amnesia, waking up and saying, I've forgotten everything God's done for me. Let's create a new religious system. And I think more realistically, what's happened is Moses has been up the mountain for a while. And the people are beginning to get antsy about their connection to God. They are beginning to worry about how they will relate with God and if they will relate with God. We don't have Moses. We need a way to communicate with God, to experience God's presence. To, to, we need this. And they contravene the way God has told them to relate with him. They contradict and go against in this seemingly good desire what he has expressed as his will. So they say, make us gods who will go before us. All right, so Aaron, in a proof positive that he is not Moses. Okay, no man is worthy of trust besides the man Christ Jesus, but... Moses is held in high regard in the scripture, and Aaron is proving himself to be a cheap counterfeit at this moment. Because he says, take off your gold earrings that your wives and your sons and daughters are wearing and bring them to me. And just just for, we have to pause and think about the, the irony of this. Where did they get the riches? Remember Israel, what was their background, right? Their training, they were slaves. They had no training. They had no background. They had no, you know, when they, before they left on this family vacation through the wilderness, they had all had jobs and they sold their things. No, they were, they were impoverished slave people. And now they have gold earrings and all these things. Where do they come from? From the provision of God by the plundering of Egypt. 
That is what is being given to Aaron and thrown into the fire to fashion a false god. Is that not an incredible, a sad irony? The people God has delivered are taking the plunder that God had given them and fashioning something that they desire to worship instead of God. Romans 1 just comes to mind. God in his beautiful creation has made you for him and he's given you all these things. As Paul says, he's filled your heart with joy and given you good food and you've taken all this and made other gods. And so they hand it to him and Aaron, the the text goes very clearly out of the way to say, Aaron fashions, he creates a God, right? This is not something God did for them. As God hands to Moses and to the people the plans for worship, follow the pattern I've given you, well, here comes Aaron creating a plan of his own. And even later he'll say, hey, it wasn't me. This calf just kind of jumped out of the fire. right?" But the the text doesn't allow that right now. And so the calf emerges in verse 5, and tomorrow we will have a festival to the Lord. Now, I think this is where it's worth some explaining. I do not believe that this passage is describing a dismantling of Yahweh and a replacing of him in the way that we might think, now they just decided to randomly worship a bull or a calf. It is no less a problem. But I think what's being described is now... The Ark of the Covenant, the mediator Moses, the tabernacle that has been laid out for them, right? These these plans, they seem in jeopardy because Moses hasn't come back. What's going to happen? Are we going to have God with us? And they revert to the, the things they know of the pagan idolatry around them. That this is actually a fairly common representation of idolatrous worship. And the worship was not of the bull. It is worship of an idol bull, right? But do you, what, what is the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark of the Covenant is the place where heaven and earth meet. God is not the Ark of the Covenant, but rests above the Ark of the Covenant, right? The bull, likewise, is not in the, the thinking of these people, probably. The God, perhaps they would be thinking, this is the, this is the, the, the place where God rides to meet his people, on the back of a bull, like Baal. On the back of, of this, this is the new ark. This is the place now where heaven and earth meet, where we can meet God. I think there is some syncretism even in the language that there are used. The language is a plural. Perhaps they're borrowing, thinking God's the highest God, Yahweh's the highest God. But, but let, let's take this, this calf and now make sure, think about it, make sure that we have a way to access God. You know, that's really a, a, a huge part of what idolatry is. It's the leveraging, the arm twisting of, of gods. I came to you, little Buddha, and I killed a chicken. Or, or you know, probably Buddha didn't want you to do that, but I, 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 I offered you some vegetables. And now you need to meet me or... Fix my life or help me, saint. Uh, I can't remember what the saint of safe travels is. But I have done these things in order to get something from you. I have rigged the system in my favor. This is what idolatry often is. And this is what the calf seems to be. is a place where we can make sure God will meet with us. We've created this place where we know we can get to him. Which is... Very different, by the way, than even the function of the tabernacle. God said, I will be with you. But even inside, the ark was not just in the midst of the camp displayed like that. His holiness was a weighty thing. So Moses is informed by God. Verse 7, go down. And I think the language is powerful here. He's intentionally saying, go down, Moses, to your people whom you brought out of Egypt. They've become corrupt. They have done exactly what I told you not to do in the second commandment. It does not, I, I, we might think the first commandment, no other gods before me, but I think it's actually the, that probably closer to the heart of the second commandment, the graven, these images. No, nonetheless, no, uh, no less problematic. And, and, and God says something grave. Look at verse 9. I have seen these people. My anger 
They're stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Okay, this is, this is a, a, a significant set of words here that God's saying, let, let me at them. Let me at them because I am going to bring upon them exactly what they deserve. Now, we, we, this picture of the golden calf worship, the people come out to eat and drink and indulge in revelry. What is God seeing as he looks down? What is Moses being told about? Well, it seems that probably what is happening is something that is just an intense mockery of what has already taken place. The, il- the elders of Israel, in a passage that we didn't read as a congregation in chapter 24, when they get to partake of some of the presence of God, they eat and they drink. When the people of Israel, when they are delivered by God, they sing to his praises. And now, at the foot of the mountain, they have falsely manufactured, not just a false way to God, but it seems even the plurality of started worshiping all these gods, and they're doing the same things. They're making a mockery. Moses is gone. Aaron is leading in a false set of worship that even this word revelry includes, I think, sexual, sexuality, promiscuity, that the purity described when God was going to descend to Sinai is now completely contrasted. And that's what I think is being described in this passage. No Moses, Aaron. No, the, in the place of the ark and the tabernacle and the proper worship, they have this Eating and drinking and revelry, there's a contrast. The people have fallen a far distance. And, and, and Moses falls essentially on the, before God. Look at verse 11. And he says, Lord, why should your anger burn against the people? Against your people. Moses kind of answers back, not in a, in a rude way, but in an accessory way. God had said, these are your people. Moses, you led this corrupt group out of here. When we know that, that God knows he did that, right? He, he delivered them. But he's trying to make a theological point. This is, this is, not, the kind, this is not my people that act like this. And, and, and Moses says, no, these are your people. And, and your name and your promises are at stake. So let me intercede, not because I don't want to see them judged. He doesn't want to see them judged. I'm convinced of that. But it's, it is intercession on the basis of the, the highest and most worthy causes. God's name, God's reputation, his promises, his word. Because that's what's going to come into focus in this passage. Is that Moses says, listen, the Egyptians, they're going to look and say, oh, sweet. He toppled all the Egyptian gods and he crushed them so that he could take them out into the mountains and snuff them out like a wick. What a victory God has accomplished to deliver these people into his trap. You're going to be mocked. You're going to, the, the great work of your strong arm. Remember, God said, I'm going to show you in a way that nobody's ever known my name. Because I'm going to deliver you from Pharaoh. That name is about to be tarnished if these people get extinguished the way they deserve. And Moses intercedes based on what matters most. And in the passage, he goes down from the mountain. All right, the Lord, verse 14, turns back. He relents and does not bring on them the disaster he threatened. Why? Because of his name and because of the promises he made to the forefathers. And Moses heads down with the law of God in their hands. By the way, I think there is a, there is a, a load communicated by the fact that these people have all they need for worship except for the words of God. Right? The, the people at the bottom of the mountain, they have, they've got an image. They've got some ritual. They even have a leader. But they don't have the words of God. Moses has them on his way down to them. And that's square one to figure out that they're actually in false worship. Right? If we, if we ever gather and the words of God are not written, and, or excuse me, not read, and, and held up, and prayed, and studied, then, then we have truly wasted our gathering. But Moses heads down and here's what he sees. He sees this and he says, I hear singing 
instead of war. Joshua doesn't understand. Remember, Joshua's halfway up the mountain. Moses picks him up on the way down. This is the way they went up earlier in the chapters. And, 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 and they say, what's going on? And Moses says, essentially, this is, this is the opposite of the song in Exodus 15. The people singing to God. Now they're singing, but it's, it's the hallmark of rebellion, not praise to the true God. It's the hallmark of, of I hear a song. And when he sees it, Moses is unable to uh, assuage. He's unable to, to, to hold back his own anger. Remember, he, he tried to call God and say, no, 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 please have mercy for the sake of the patriarchs, for the sake of the promises you made, for your own reputation. And Moses sees it and he chucks the commandments, the stone tablets, and breaks them in his anger. And it says he, he burns, Moses moves in a way that Aaron should have, ne- Aaron should have never come out of the fire, right? But Aaron, Aaron should have led differently. And Moses judges this calf first. And I want to just put a, put a parenthesis around how he judges it. He takes this idol and he, he melts it and he spreads it on the water. Okay? And it makes the people, it's in the water reservoir that people have to drink now. Think about where the false god has gone. Trying to usurp the authority of God. This false worship at the hands of God's servant here has actually become excrement. By the time this passage is finished, right? It's, got, it's passed through the bowels of the people. If that's not a clear enough rendering on what this golden calf is worth. It is burned down and fed to the people, and you know what happens to what you eat and drink. This is, a, a, is absolutely a disgusting thing in the eyes of God that this calf exists. And, and Aaron tries to, tries to explain himself. Moses doesn't even dignify him with a response, but he calls the people who will be faithful to rally to him. Now, I think this could use some explaining because it, Moses says... Listen, if people, apparently the revelry and the worship of this false god doesn't pause when Moses gets there. It doesn't stop. It's not like dad's home, everybody, you know, clear out the back door from the party. It seems that there are at least some people who are persisting in this false worship and this false indulgence. And so Moses, though his presence didn't quell the idolatry, Moses calls whoever will be faithful to him. And, and it's the, it is the priestly class of the Levites that come. And I think this even would indicate that Aaron, who serves God, will serve God in the temple, has a change of a repentant heart. And he says to them, now you need to go wage justice. And this is a tough passage for us to to, to interpret because he says it doesn't, essentially what he describes is, as I read earlier for you, even if it's family, even if it's family, you need to go and put an end to anyone who is persisting in this idolatry. If, if the passage had said, kill everyone, and then the number read in the millions, because that's what, Paul, uh, that's what we know is about the size of this people, then it may seem like a picture where God is just, through Moses, judging in the way he said he wouldn't on the mountain. But it seems that right now, there are people who are persisting, perhaps leading their families and, and, and sections of the community to, to, to unrelenting rebellion against God. And so the Levites rally and they kill 3,000 people. And it says, it goes out of the way to say, even if they are friend or family, son or brother, right? And, and, and for a moment, I think this starts to get us towards what, what the passage is, is, is cultivating for us. This, this sounds, I mean, it doesn't sound, it is awful. The Levites are told, go out, and if anyone is persisting in rebelling against God, judge them. Don't look at anyone in terms of their allegiance to you. Look at them in terms of their allegiance to God. And wage this judgment. And if in, unless you have a callous or an unrealistic perspective of what is described, this should cause pause in your heart. The Levites are being asked to do something incredibly graphic and even sorrowful. 
When you think about the reality of executing, even if they're in rebellion against God, people that you know and love. But I think this is why, this is why I ask the question, what matters most? When, when, when God looked down from the mountain, where did Moses appeal? He said, your name's at stake. Your name's at stake. You're at stake. Your reputation, your promises. You can't, don't do this because, because it's, going to, it's going to hinder what matters most. You and your name and your word, your character, God. This is the reason you should relent. Not because of some other sentiment. And what should motivate the Levites? Not even the highest definitions of human love towards each other in families. But the fact that God matters most to them. And if I can illustrate this in a way, I sat this week with a young man who thought that God's actions of judgment, he was specifically thinking of hell and the eternal judgment that does come on, on the unrepentant, a horrific thought. He thought them unfair. And I tried to talk with him about the fact that the problem in really it, it lay at the feet of his priorities. He described, why, why would God just do this to all these people? Sure, maybe the murderer and the rapist or, or whatever, but, but why would God judge these people? And, 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 and even in his description, he was describing God as this haphazard, vindictive, sick violent person and I said yeah if, if, if today a man was walking across the parking lot and I come out of nowhere and I tackle him and I, and I brutally beat him with my hands you look at me and you say what on earth are you doing but does the picture change if my little toddler is, is in the parking lot and that same man is running at my little daughter with a knife. It absolutely does, right? In fact, all the fathers and mothers understand then my, my violent interception of that person, right? If someone's coming at my pregnant wife with a, a crowbar to injure her, right? I am not in a dilemma of priorities, I am going to move aggressively to end what is trying to end the one I love, right? And that my love for, for my sense of priority in my loves motivates the opposition of what will destroy it. Does that shed some light then on the allegiance the Levites are called to? on the reason that Moses intercedes from, not just show mercy to these people, but first and foremost, what matters most? The name of God, the character of God, the reputation and promises of God. And when these people persist in tearing down what matters most, this judgment on that rebellion is justified. I would say it even should make sense to us. And the reason it doesn't make sense to us, the reason I sat with that man in that coffee shop and he did not understand is because he still was thinking the highest good, the greatest reality was these people. They mattered more. And if they matter more, then how could God judge them for something they've done? They're the highest end. They're the chief love. They can't be judged because they are what matters most. I can't bend my will to God because I'm what matters most. How could God interrupt my plans or frustrate my desires? He is not on top, but, God, but I am think that, that this passage starts to speak not just of idolatry, but of the disordering of our priorities, because that's, after all, what is at the heart of idolatry. God is not the top of the heap. And so, their judgment begins to make sense, because God, in any place but number one, is a violent assault and affront to who he is.
So they tear down the rebellion. And Moses says, I'm going to go try and make atonement for your sin. And, and he can't, frankly. He cannot. Because he, he does intercede for them, but he, 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 he cannot make atonement. And there's judgment at the end of chapter 32. Now, chapter 33 brings us sobering words. The consistent sin of Israel, it, it, it says, hey, I'm going to deliver to you the promises that I gave to Abraham. I'm going to give to you these things. But, God says with a, 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 a glaring concession, which ought to ring loud, he says, I am not going to be with you. My presence is now going to be gone. And we talked about this last week. We have spent like 10 chapters looking at the tabernacle and the glory, the theological center of Exodus, is that God is now going to be with his people. That's why 20 chapters are devoted to the tabernacle. And God says, I am not going to be with you because of your sin. God loves to fellowship with his people, but our sin has built an obstruction. 33, 7 through, through 12, 11 gives us a picture of where, how Moses experienced something that the others could not, of this face-to-face -face interaction and fellowship with God. And this is what's at stake now. God's presence, his wisdom available to their leader, and his glory in their midst, it, it, we, accompanying Israel, is at stake and going to be lost. And so Moses intercedes again. Please, you have to be with us. How will, how will Israel be any different than any nation on earth? Remember what we said last week? What makes Israel special? It's that God's with them. So Moses says in 30, 33, Lord, you have to tell me who will be with me. Who's going to help me? What's going to make your people special? How will your plan sparkle if Israel just sits like the rest of the nations in a place they got from God, but not with God in that place? What will they do? And God relents at the, at the, the pleading of Moses, and he says, I will be with you. I will do everything you've asked, verse 17. I will be with him. And, and, and just as the, the, the clarity of Sinai began where God descended on the mountain, Moses asked, show me your glory again. Show me and, and even more. And so God does graciously. He cannot show him all of his glory, right? Because sin has created separation even for Moses. No one can see me face to face and live. Which I think helps us understand the fact that, that this imagery in the tent of meeting that a man talks with his friend is, is the description. No one can see God full on, experience the immediate presence of God unhindered, unfettered, unfiltered without justice for their sin. And so Moses, Moses is protected by the hand of God and he hears about the character of God. What matters most, the person of God, the presence of God. God says, I will be with you and I will reveal myself to you. Look at 34 verses 6 and, and following. And he passed the Lord, verse 5, then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents of the third and fourth generation. And Moses, when he sees God for who he is, bowed down to the ground at once and worshipped. And he says, Lord, if I found favor in your eyes, then let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin and take us as your inheritance. And God responds in kind that he will walk with these people. And Moses embraces again. What, what has happened in this passage? What is happening? The presence of God among his people, is threatened by their sinfulness. The people have decided that other things may be more important. They've decided that their own priorities, their own approach to God, that any of these things, and it, and it is fundamentally threatening their experience of God among them. And so Moses comes on his face and says, on the basis of what matters most, your name and your character... 
Give us what matters most to us, your presence among us. Don't leave us, please. And God responds, showing himself, as that name describes, compassionate, willing to forgive, willing to look over, not look, not look past in the sense of forget or, or, or unattend, but willing to be gracious to the wicked and the rebellious and sinful. But to those who do not turn from their, their sin, he, it will have long, even generational consequences. The Lord who will go with a stiff-necked people if they are repentant. And so he reissues some of his commandments from the law. And in the end of 35, we see that Moses now bears again the symbol of, of God's presence with him. He comes down from the mountain with the two tablets in his hand and with a radiant face shining from the presence of God. But the people, they can't handle it, can they? He has to cover his face. Still, Israel is so, is so far from what they must be, what they should be, that even the representative of God, having been in the presence of God, is too much for them to bear. A veil was placed over their face. I think it, it, this, this, this passage... Dropped in the middle, not, not dropped in the middle, but, but told in the middle of the instructions for the tabernacle, God with us. And the realization, because what happens? The people of sin and the rest of Exodus, they actually come forward and they obey and they build the tabernacle as it was described. In between then, there was a, a construction of false worship and a fleeing from God in the way he had revealed himself. Highlighting the gracious nature of God, the severity of Israel's sinfulness, and the willingness of him, God with us, to, to covenant with even sinful people. You see, Israel, I think, should read this throughout their history and glory in their covenant with God. Not to disregard it. They should take a lesson from the people who, who, who trampled so quickly underfoot the instructions of the tabernacle and the ark and the proper worship of God. They looked down on what they had received and they left it in the first moment of doubt. They were, it was delivered by Moses, a wonderful mediator, and delivered with beautiful blessings, the very presence of God. And, and they should all, throughout their history, look and say, look at these people, how they, they barely escaped from the edge of losing the presence of God. Because as we read the Old Testament, Israel persists in their rebellion, and ultimately the glory of God does depart from his temple because of their sinfulness. They may make a, a, a turn back to him over time, but then in Ezekiel, it gives way. His glory has left them. They're, they're rebellious, idolatrous, and lost. And that's why John the Baptist says to them, repent. Come back. Turn from your wicked ways. That's why Jesus goes before the Father. And better than Moses, can make atonement. Does make atonement. He, he lays down before them, not just pleased but his own very life and he is considered crushed for our iniquities he restores the presence of god that the, the the sinfulness of god's people persisted and god graciously demonstrated his character in forbearing and love continuing in his covenant with people who seemed intent on rebellion and ultimately their sin seemed to have won out to drive him out. But Jesus, ultimately, God himself in flesh overcame even their sinfulness so that then their rebellious hearts would be changed so that then they would receive the permanent, un uncorruptible presence of God. First by his spirit, the down payment of ultimately being eternally in his presence in the new creation. Look at the way you can hear from the passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, if the ministry that brought death, describing the first giving of the law, which was engraved on letters and stone, came with glory. What was the glory that it came with? Moses' face shone like the sun, right? I mean, Moses was brilliantly beautiful. If I read for you Exodus and you said, oh, this is, 
It's a ministry that brings death. No, you'd be reading and say, wow, this is incredible that God would reveal him this way. Well, what we know is that the law revealed our sin. That's how it brought death. But it still came with glory. So that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory. Transitory though it was, eventually Moses' face stopped shining. Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? Paul asks. If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? You know why the glory of God left the temple eventually, even though God said this is what's going to happen and warned them and was merciful? Because they persisted in sinfulness. The law did not change them in the heart. For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains of the Old Covenant when the Old Covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even this day, people are like, when they hear Moses, they are like, like the Israelites. A veil covers their hearts, as we saw with so many Jews not turning to Paul's preaching. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, from which, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Let me just connect these two passages. Israel proved very quickly that you can take the, the girl out of Egypt, but you can't take Egypt out of the girl. And that that was going to the problem that threatened the presence of God among them. The most important thing was God and his presence with us. And sinfulness was a constant threat to that. It's what got Adam and Eve kicked out of the garden, and it what ultimately was threatening God's presence in this restoration Israel. But when God, by his spirit, did something greater than simply come amongst the, a group of sinful people, actually took root inside the sinful people and changed them in their hearts. Now, the people are not, not like the Old Covenant where they could barely stand Moses' glory from his being with God. Now, with unveiled faces, they can enjoy the glory. In fact, it says here that in the New Covenant, they are becoming glorious like that glory. They are transforming into greater degrees of that glory. Not just beholding the glory, sharing the glory. That the beauty of the tabernacle that we talked about last week, and and the the reason the people, when they hear God's presence is going to leave them, they weep, is because the presence of God among the people is the most important thing. God is the most important one, and his presence with them is the most important thing. It's what they truly should have ordered in their worship. And if Israel was supposed to glory in their covenant, then Resurrection Church must glory in the new covenant. That Jesus, because he lived perfectly the way Israel could not, and any human could not, all in Adam could not, he, he, he died sacrificially for us, in our place, and rose victoriously, Peter says, that he stands and he pours out God's spirit on God's people, delivering to them not just the presence of God around them, but in them, not just a stone-hearted people with a tent of meeting, but actually a people that are the tent of the living God the dwelling place in which God resides. A a group of people who now provide, not only only provided a place to be around God, but actually have God dwelling in them because of the work of Jesus Christ. And if, if, if I can just encourage you to a couple things. This passage, in its warning against idolatry in the Old Covenant, 
has to stand for us as a warning against idolatry always. What matters most? Well, I don't simply mean that you don't put up a little statue here at the church. What I mean is that you never order your priorities around something else. That you never make at the center and highest end of your worship anyone or anything but God and his presence among you and your family in you. In our gathering as a body. That, that, that if Israel, they were worried about their connection with God and they quickly manufactured things to find a way to worship God, but not the way he had revealed. And their sinfulness compromised what really, truly mattered most. Not them feeling safe or comfortable in their worship. Not them hoping to get what they could get from God. Not them any of these things, but, but God himself. And they knew when God threatened to pull away from them what was that really most important. I would encourage you, do not, do not disorder your priorities and f- create in your heart uh, false idols, false champions of your life. It's a warning also to, to people who do not know and trust in Jesus Christ that even slight counterfeits are not tolerable. If, if, if Israel's heart was, hey, Moses is gone and the Ark of the Covenant, we need, we, we, need, we, need, we need some way to relate with God. Let's worship God, but in a way that he didn't prescribe. You know that there is no such thing as multiple ways up the mountain to God. And when someone in our age wants to tell you pluralism is okay and that you know, somebody can be a good Muslim or a good uh, Buddhist or a good atheist and find their way to God, that they are not speaking of of the true and living God. And they will not find at the top of the mountain that they are on Sinai. They will find themselves on some other mountain with no God to meet because the God of heaven and earth who created us and deserves our allegiance has said that there is salvation in no other name. If I can borrow the imagery, you can't worship on any other ark. You can't make a calf instead of the Ark of the Covenant. It is only through His Son, Jesus Christ, that we can worship. And it should warn the believers that we must have boldness. You sit with co-workers and friends and family members who would gladly talk as if we're all religious people and that my way to raise my family and, 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 and order my life is, is as good as your way. And you feel the fear rise in your heart. And I would encourage you and call you to remember what matters most. What must be highest. The boldness that would swell up in me to oppose that one that would destroy my children or my wife in that parking lot in the image, right? That boldness needs to, with grace, swell up in you to say boldly, no, 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 no. You you would be leading your family to condemnation. You would be ordering your life toward its end and judgment. No, you can't. we're not on equal plane. Not because we're good in anything, but as you stand with someone else, if you as a believer are tempted to just say, go ahead towards the golden calf, think about the unloving nature of that statement. Sure, enjoy the golden calf, but my family and I have chosen to worship the God on the top of Sinai in the tabernacle, the temple. In Israel, that would have not been a loving statement, right? That is exactly what you're saying when you tolerate, excuse, or even just passively let by statements that we've decided to worship other than Jesus Christ, God's Son whom He sent. We must have boldness in these neighborhoods, in our workplaces, to say, I love you, and I'm not going to force you to worship anyone, but I am going to call you to worship only one. Order your priorities toward God. And it should bring joy for every believer in here. We have a greater fellowship than Moses. We We can embrace Jesus and all his blessings, who has delivered to us not only the presence of God, around us or in the center of our camp or in a portion of our location. But in us, he has taken us not from just people who could visit the temple, but are the temple of the living God. He has given us access to greater glory. Glory so great that the old glory 
barely shines in comparison. The new covenants that Jesus has won by his blood should instigate hope and life and joy to proclaim it in our hearts. It's in Christ. Let's pray. Father, I...